Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation, part two of our 2022 year in review. I'd like to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the last show. It's been another fantastic year for us, filled with incredible guests and amazing conversations. One of the most exciting changes this year is a move to a broader discussion to include geographies outside China and explore the ins and outs of the markets and consumers across Southeast Asia. We are so incredibly grateful to you, our listeners, for continuing to enjoy our show and giving us the feedback we need to continue to deliver guests and content that matter to you. It's truly our pleasure to be able to put this together week in and week out for you all to enjoy. We also want to thank all our amazing guests this past year who provide the expert commentary and insights. It's their lifetime of hard work and expertise that we are leveraging and we know it. So without further ado, part two of our 2022 Year in Review. We're hitting the rewind button to take a look back at some of our favorite moments from this past year. And if you like what you hear, feel free to jump directly to the full episode to hear it in its entirety. Enjoy. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half of the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market that no globally minded organization should ignore. But entering markets like China, Japan, or Southeast Asia is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. However, times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success growing their key markets in APAC. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies grow in the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful Asia market entry and growth strategies by interviewing the experts who've done it before and truly understand what it takes to be successful in the region. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to the negotiation. Brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Episodes 150 and 151, released on October 5th and 12th, brought us Louis Udard, founder of Creative Capital. Louis is an entrepreneur, a business and investment coach, and a board member and advisor to many startup companies. The Creative Capital China team has worked with European companies in China and helping launch little-known brands into major Western markets. By establishing... By establishing preeminent international brand awareness and strong brand relationships, Creative Capital is one of the only firms in China that focuses on widening awareness of Chinese companies beyond their home market. In this clip from episode two, I asked Louis if he would agree or disagree and why with the statement that Chinese brands have met some headwinds in their attempts to be successful in Western markets. Here's what he had to say. I think it's really changing. I think it, I would agree with, with this statement maybe a few years ago. Uh, and, and I really see the world uh, changing uh, through, I think, different um, angle, through uh, geographical angle and also through a category angle. Um, I will start by the uh, geographical angle. So uh, if you look, so I used to have an office in, uh, in Jakarta and going to uh, Southeast Asia and Jakarta, for instance, uh, um, I was the last couple of years amazed to see the rise of so many Chinese brands, so many Chinese brands in the retail space with uh, brands like uh, Miniso or Mumuso, which are kind of $1 stores, but with a very strong concept and doing uh, uh, very well. Um, So plenty of uh, uh, retailers brands uh, opening right now in in Southeast Asia. Um, In terms of uh, category wise, I think... um, so we've got uh, uh, um, tech product. I mean, uh, Xiaomi now is doing a, a very good job uh, entering the uh, Western market. There is a big flagship of Xiaomi stores uh, all, all around uh, Europe. Uh, in the car category, uh, you can see now in uh, Paris, uh, Link & Co. Uh, uh, Chinese cars. Um, in, um, in the luxury um, uh, icicle, uh, which is the Chinese uh, uh, premium fashion brand, um, now has three or four stores uh, in Paris, and, and they are doing fairly, uh, uh, fairly well. Um, on the um, uh, cosmetics uh, side, so cosmetics, lots of them are in Southeast Asia, but also here uh, some uh, great Chinese brands looking at the uh, European and uh, US market. Um, on the tech products, so you, we are not going to talk again about uh, uh, WeChat, but uh, uh, Ali is doing lots of investments in uh, Europe. Uh, you also 
also have obviously uh, uh, TikTok, uh, which is uh, um, uh, owned by uh, uh, ByteDance, which is a uh, doing. Uh, so, so, so I think it's very much uh, changing, and you, we see more and more Chinese brands under different categories. So, I've listed retail, I've listed fashion, I've listed uh, tech, uh, car. Uh, we could add computers with Lenovo. So, so, so the, the world is definitely changing, and, and I think what I find interesting is when, when when we make this parallel with Chinese consumers, which a couple of years ago would have a tendency in many product categories to prefer Western brands. I think today Chinese consumers tend to prefer better brands. So they don't really care where the brand is from as long as it's a good brand relevant to their need um, and, and talking uh, to their uh, lifestyle. On November 9th, we brought back Jacob Cook for our 155th episode. Jake is the co-founder and CEO of WPIC Marketing and Technologies, a leading e-commerce and technology consultancy that drives growth for global brands in China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Having lived in Beijing since 2003, Jacob is a regular contributor to international media on e-commerce, retail, and technology trends in China. He's a member of the MIT Sloan School of Management and holds an advanced certificate in engineering from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Although we brought him in to discuss the impending Singles Day shopping bonanza at the time, I was really intrigued to discuss what Douyin is doing in the market lately. So that's the clip I've chosen. And here's what he had to say. Well, Douyin focuses on live streaming and short form video. So when you look at it, it's a great way to um, it's a great medium, especially for fashion, right? When by you can try new things on, you can interact with the models, try this on with that. What does it look like with glasses? Just questions like that. So it, these interactive fashion shows that go on for eight hours a day are dominating that category. You're actually seeing GMV move over from Tmall into Douyin. Even with the rise of all the other platforms in the last 10 years, you never saw any GMV move. It was always incremental. First time it's actually moved. Um, that's a big deal. Uh, secondly, um, they're really good at suggesting new things with that format. You know, the algorithms are um, not good on Tmall for suggesting new things. Like they, the algorithms and the AI is is rigged so that you to to get more GMV out of you. So they know if you're a red wine drinker, they're going to recommend a red wine. Really difficult though for to recommend something to you that you might also like. <laughs> And they know that the chances of them doing that will probably not lead to GMV. So they want to keep you in your lane because that's what's actually going to drive more GMV to the platform. However, on the videos, if I find a guy who's roughly got my taste, I, I'd love to listen to suggestions on things that would enhance my lifestyle for three to four hours. And the algorithms don't do a very good job of that. I have to know what I want on Tmall usually before going in there and buying it. Right. We're live streaming platforms like TikTok and just I can go shop. I can go walk like the streets of a mall and, and, and buy new things going to the mall without an intention, without a specific thing that I wanted to buy beforehand. I just want to go shopping, you know, and, and e-commerce didn't do that. Right. It, it, that was kind of the experience that was missing. Uh, so now I think, um, I think that's why they're going to do very well. Uh, I think that's why other platforms are starting to catch up. You know, we get a lot of interest from overseas platforms like Rakuten and Walmart asking us about China and, 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 you know, acknowledging that the trends that start here are going to be happening in other markets too, as well. So that's the advice that we're giving out. On February 8th of 2022, we released episode 129 with Karen Ragavan, a brand and business development consultant and growth advisor to both heritage beauty brands and startups. She is also the vice president of brand development at the natural ingredient company, Parisima. Karen is a member of chief a private network built to drive more women into positions of power and keep them there. I asked Karen for some tactics she's seeing used that are driving growth in China in the beauty space that Western brands should take notice of. Yes, I, and I think the KOL topic is, is is a tough nut to crack. I think everybody knows that that's the hot word to go to. Um, it, they, it's, it's actually probably going to be a lot pricier than many brands anticipate. Um, so let's talk about KOLs or KOCs even. Uh, so key online consumers, right. Um, or the influencers, I think they're all doing the same thing. They're just at different levels. Um, I think the, one of the biggest key criteria that we look at, um, or we should be looking at is the quality of that KOL or KOC. There is no, um, get rich quick 
or scale quick when it comes to any type of influencers. Again, we're all humans at the end of the day. We need to build that relationship, whether it's at the KOL level or the KOC level, to really build that relationship with them, um, make sure that the story about the brand and the key points of differentiation of whatever products you may be seeding them is 100% clear and that they're on board with the products that they're receiving. Um, I, I do know that there are some platforms out there that to have some sort of algorithm. You can scale the seeding very quickly. Um, that is one way of doing it. Um, it's just may not, it just may not be the best return on investment because the quality of the KOL or KOC that you may be um, targeting may not be the ones that you actually want. So you may get a lot of volume, but not a lot of quality. Uh, one, one neat trick is to look at the KOL and KOC on a global scale. Not all Chinese KOL or KOCs may reside in China. Um, and so this is something that I like to talk to a lot of my clients about, which is looking at the Chinese on a global basis. Where do they reside and whether they're influential to your end consumer in China or not? So looking beyond just China borders is something that I would definitely advise um, many brands looking to enter China or looking to build their um, presence online um, is looking at where that Chinese user could be and that she may not necessarily or he may not necessarily be residing in China. They could be overseas and highly influential on social. Released on July 27th and August 3rd were episodes 142 and 143 with Jeff Daggett, founder and CEO of Eyes On, a brand and retail development and management company offering brand, retail, hospitality and licensing management services and representation in Japan and the United States. Since 2002, Izon has assisted a number of big-name retail brands such as Apple, Columbia Sportswear, Nordstrom, Shinjuku Takano, and NBC Universal. Jeff's background includes over three decades of experience at leading global companies in the Asia-Pacific, specifically in investment banking, real estate, retail operations, merchandising, marketing, and general management. He also spent six years at Disney as VP of Consumer Products, which is why I just had to ask him, given the massive catalog of IP and products, how difficult it was to manage the trademark and brand IP, or was that a naive question and it didn't require managing at all? Here's what he had to say. It, it does, but it's really something that you, you chip away at. And I was fortunate to be working in Japan. Disney first opened in Japan in 1959. So it had been here already for a while. It had the benefit in Japan is, is it over time has come to benefit in China and over time will continue to benefit in, in India. We kind of see this rolling understanding of what uh, intellectual property is and what it means. And generally speaking, is each market has its own intellectual property that it needs, it needs to protect. The, the systems for protecting everyone's intellectual property improves. I, I, I remember back when I was um, working for Gap, I spent one day with Den Fujita, who's the founder of uh, McDonald's Japan. Um, he's the primary inspiration for Masayoshi Son over at uh, SoftBank. And, and he, you know, he talked about the years he spent trying to get the Big Mac trademark away from the squatter that had it in Japan. So, you know, now we think of Japan as being buttoned down in terms of intellectual property, but it it had its frontier days as well with, you know, some love hotel. If I remember right, the apocryphal tale was some love hotel uh, for anyone not familiar with love, ho what love hotels are. They're the small boutique hotels along the expressways where if one needs to stop for a day stay, you can, Anyways, there was some one of these hotels had registered Hilton and Hilton Hotel struggled for quite a while to get its brand. So so um, now we think of Japan as being completely buttoned down and the problem territories are elsewhere. But um, each market goes through this. And I'm, I'm certain the U.S. was probably also the Wild West, you know, in terms of intellectual property back in the 20s and 30s. I wasn't around then, so I'd need someone who knows more than me to tell me for certain. But we all go through that evolution. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, you know, I mentioned before how Disney tends to be controlling. And again, I think it's a positive thing. And my, my story for why I think that is so is, um, when you learn Disney's history, uh, Walt Disney lost his first character. So he, he and Ubi works, his partner worked on Oswald, the lucky rabbit, uh, and then his distributor, 
took that character away from them um, because they didn't they didn't have the rights. And um, whether that, you know, right legally or not, it was, you know, it, it seemed through all of the the you know, the stories that are told about that uh, episode that, it, you know, it was like, you know, losing a child and it was devastating. And, um, uh, you know, Disney was really a, a two person operation. Walt's older brother, uh, um, Roy Disney, um, you know, really managed the finances and Walt also having, you know, we talked about failure and, the, and, the, and I would say the, the importance of failure. Disney at that point also had gone bankrupt, I think twice. So, um, so Roy was like, I, I'm an older brother. So I'm imagining Roy must have been super protective of Walt, just seeing his talent and, and whatnot. And so, um, you know, when Mickey came along, they locked it down and they locked everything down after that. And, you know, that's the, you know, there it's a, and so I, I use the words locked down positively. They locked down their IP. They're very uh, locked down financially. And I, and I think those are all really important things and a part of that, that culture that's necessary. So when they, when they do see these IP um, in, infringements, um, you know, certainly as quickly as they can, they're tipping away at them and, and trying to get their, their IP portfolio, um, you know, sorted in each of their markets as best they can to just, a part of that DNA. That uh, was a part of any IP holder's DNA, but I, you know, I, I, Disney is definitely methodical about it. On September 21st and 28th, we released episodes 148 and 149 with Akio Tanaka, co-founder and partner at Headline VC. Headline VC is a technology-focused venture capital firm that sees the world's future through the lens of exponential technologies. The aim of Headline is to identify, fund, and partner with companies who are building these new products and services and to make them more accessible to mainstream consumers. Akio Tanaka is one of the most influential investors in Japan and has been known to be passionately committed to the local ecosystem. With that in mind, we asked him for his opinion of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Japan and to compare it to those of its neighboring countries. Japan is a very strange place, right? So it's still the third largest economy in the world after U.S. and China. But, but the entrepreneur pool is extremely small compared to those uh, giants like U.S. and China, especially compared to China, which has a very large entrepreneur pool. So that's always been a challenge for us, uh, investing in Japan. So we did actually try to address this issue by starting uh, uh, Entrepreneurs uh, Society in Japan. We, we call this IVS, and IVS is the longest-running Founders Conference in Japan. Uh, we've done this, actually, this precedes our fund. So we've done this now for 16 years. And in the past 16 years, I think we've had 20,000 different uh, tech founders come join our event. Our event is actually set up like an off two, three day offsite away from Tokyo and where people come uh, meet each other every six months and uh, learn from each other. And, and this actually platform has produced many new businesses. And in fact, we also created a large volunteer ecosystem around this. Every year we have like 100, 200 volunteers who help us run this uh, com uh, community. And usually volunteer members are students, uh, uh, very business-minded, tech like entrepreneur-minded students in the last year of university, or maybe they're uh, first or second year employees of large tech companies. And because they are no founders, they cannot come to our event, but they can still become a volunteer and come join us. Um, what's interesting is that from this volunteer pool, I think we have at least one IPO, meaning some people came to join us our event as a volunteer. They got inspired by other entrepreneurs. So they launched their own business and they came to our event and presented in a pitch contest and got funding. And, you know, like, so I had uh, the quickest case I had was this uh, lady, uh, Nakasan. She came to join us, I think around 2010, uh, when she was working at Facebook, I think, and uh, uh, was a volunteer. A uh, couple of years later, she launched her own business and uh, a lot of uh, community members of our IVS were her first angels. And then uh, soon later, he she came to pitch at our pitch context at the event. And I think maybe uh, five years ago or so, she went IPO in Japan. So 
so we think uh, this pool is still small compared to other uh, markets, but we've been very actively promoting and growing this pool ourselves. What's holding it back? Generally speaking, I think people were under the assumption that the being working for big companies in Japan was the most secure way to plan your life, which was true maybe until 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And then we started seeing, you know, massive failures of big companies uh, 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 like, you know, uh, you know, Toshiba and, and all the other like big Japanese brands, which previously people thought were uh, uh, invincible. But in fact, they are just as vulnerable as any other companies. So, and, and, and with that, people started thinking, well, okay, am I going to be doing this job the rest of my life? When I, I don't even have assurance and uh, people started, I think, taking more risk at the same time. Um, this in this last 20 years, we've starting, st- we started seeing more successful entrepreneurs. And so there's a lot of role models out there. Even people who left their secure jobs, say at Sony and those big companies in their middle age years and uh, still able to create a, a new company. So I think, uh, it's not quite there like China, but we're starting to have this entrepreneurial culture in Japan, and it's changing. Our last clip, celebrating an amazing 2022 for the podcast, comes from episode 137, released on June 22nd, featuring Bill Tung, managing partner at Peaks Consulting, a global brand, retail, and management consultancy firm. Since its founding in 2015, Peaks Consulting has built an internationally recognized consultancy based on trust and relationships before business. Peaks currently serves consumers in 20 countries and counting. Bill has also served as the VP of Europe and Asia Pacific at Rockport, VP of International Sales at Columbia Sportswear, Executive VP of International Sales at New Balance, Managing Director at Fanatics Inc., and Asia Pacific General Manager of Clark's. This final clip is when I asked Bill, given his 13 years at Columbia Sportswear, how the outdoor equipment and apparel market has changed and evolved in APAC. Enjoy. In the beginning, Todd, uh, cl- uh, when I started, uh, Columbia was in Japan, uh, was in Korea, was not in China. Uh, and, uh, and this was 2003, 2004. I, I know the, the uh, you know, the thinking China was early days at that time. Not, none of the big global outdoor brands were in China yet. Uh, it, it, the, the, the thought was you source your products from China yourself to these consumers. Uh, and then that not a lot of brands really thought that was an opportunity. You know, Nike and Adidas, the athletic brands had been in for, for quite some time uh, and really just uh, laying the foundations of their brands. Uh, so it was interesting. I, I, I went into uh, China, met with a bunch of retailers that were selling sporting goods and they were well aware of Colombia. I mean, these guys travel around the world and uh, they, they go to trade shows and they're well aware of Colombia and the other brands. Um, but, you know, the, the general consensus at the time was, well, nobody's skiing, nobody's snowboarding, nobody's camping, nobody's trail running. All these outdoor activities that were being done in other countries really what it just was not starting yet in China. And I thought, OK, well, fine. Uh, well, then let's start anyway. And we can start to build the market and do marketing and uh, basically promote the great outdoors in China. So, so we did start with a, with a with a Swire Resources, a partner based in Hong Kong that had uh, significant experience with other brands in China. So uh, we started uh, uh, in department stores. We started shops uh, in the tier one cities, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, if you will. And then we started to sponsor outdoor uh, events, uh, outdoor trail running events. Uh, what was like camping? Uh, some of the few ski slopes that did exist up in northern China, uh, sponsoring uh, those ski slopes, just promoting the brands and activities. So it was like you, you're helping to build the market. And um, yeah, so you said you know, most brands wouldn't think about uh, Asia, but uh, I think for most brands, uh, certainly China, Japan, and Korea would certainly be in the top five, certainly in the top 10 uh, for any brands around the 
world. Uh, Korea, uh, oddly enough, uh, most people sort of oversee Korea, uh, you know, 50 million people there squeezed between China and uh, and Japan. I, I think at one point was the world's third largest outdoor apparel market after the United States and Germany. Uh, and he says, well, how could that be? Uh, it's just because the propensity of people to spend a lot of money on outdoor apparel uh, was very, very high. So, yeah, so you, you need to uncover these nuggets around the world and spend time on the ground and uh, find out what's going on. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed part two of our 2022 year in review, and we look forward to seeing you all again next year. Again, from all of us here at The Negotiation and WPIC Marketing and Technologies, we wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking at the Asia-Pacific region for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands, just like yours, enter China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation, and if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co, and be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.